Good afternoon. Welcome to this panel organized by UNESCO to celebrate the International Day of Biological Diversity, which takes place on 22nd of May every year. This year, 2020, the theme of this day is our solutions are in nature. Let me give you a small background. 2020 has been defined as a super year for biodiversity, which should lead us to a renewed global commitment to preserve biodiversity. And a number of events were planned throughout the year. Unfortunately, the current pandemic has shaken this international biodiversity agenda, but also has revealed our total interdependence with the living world and our global interconnectedness. However, despite the loss of 75% of terrestrial ecosystem, the first intergovernmental global assessment of biodiversity and its ecosystem services, which was released in May 2019, also indicated that solutions exist and it was not too late to act. This is in this context, context of COVID-19 pandemic, but also in the light of the hope given by the IPBS report that we convene you today to a conversation on the theme, what are the possible ways to regenerate ecosystems and restore our links to the living? So without more time, I will introduce you to our four panelists. We are very happy to welcome them this morning. They come from different worlds, but we think that they're very pertinent for the conversation and they are somehow pillars of the representative of pillars of, of the society. I will introduce them one by one before the first question. So um, I will start with um, Mr. Tim Christofferson. Tim Christofferson is coordinator of the Nature for Climate Branch at UN Environment and is a focal point for the UN Decade on Ecosystems Restoration. So Tim, please. As focal point for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, can you tell us why this new decade starting next year is not an additional UN Decade and how it will make the difference in reconnecting human to nature? Thank you, Noeline, and hello, everyone. The UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration starts in 2021, but we are already well advanced in preparing for it. We have a lot of interest from all kinds of segments of society, from primary schools to big uh, international NGOs, to governments, to private sector companies. So there are literally um, hundreds of partners already lining up to start on the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. That makes me hopeful. The UN General Assembly passed the resolution on the 1st of March in 2019. So all the countries in the world agreed and the goal for the decade is to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. So it's also about conservation, it's also about sustainable stewardship of our lands and to repair some of the damage that we've uh, done to the planet. Uh, why this will not be yet another decade, uh, I think we have many UN decades and many of them are very useful and have been impactful. I think this one will be even more so because it's simply an idea whose time has come. Uh, and as the saying goes by uh, French uh, novelist Victor Hugo, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. We see the emergence of a global restoration movement from youth networks to uh, communities that want to rebuild their livelihoods all across the world. So this movement is already emerging. What we can do with the UN Decade is to link these local activities to a global umbrella, to give people at a local level 
both more tools, hopefully more resources, more hope, more inspiration, and a connectedness to a global movement. And that can be immensely powerful. So at the core of this decade, we're building a digital hub where everybody can connect uh, and where we can learn from each other. And we're also, of course, hoping that uh, everybody who sees this or everybody who is interested in restoring their uh, livelihood, uh, their natural environment, will not only become a part of the decade, but a partner of the decade. We're not only inviting people to participate, we're inviting people to actively shape what the decade is. This is a term called new power, where we want to go one step beyond in the UN to just ask people to participate. We want people to help us shape this decade. The strategy will be finalized in about a month from now, and then uh, we will start to invite partners to sign up uh, in September. So yes, we hope this will be indeed hugely impactful. And thanks for organizing this, Nadine, and UNESCO. And UNESCO, of course, will be one of the core partners together with the Rio Convention Secretariat on biodiversity, on desertification, on climate change. The World Economic Forum is already a core partner, IUCN, uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, and beyond the core partners, which will be around 20, there will be hundreds of contributing initiatives and networks that we want to uh, help and support in what they do. To um, uh, time has come to really foster ecological restoration, it's time. And uh, you talk about connection, connecting people to connect human with, with the nature. And I'm pleased now to turn to the next um, panelist, Sir Tim Smith, who is the co-founder of Eden Project. And it's a good transition because Time has come now to do restoration, but Tim, 25 years back, was already engaged in this work. So, Tim, please, as co-founder of Eden Project, can you briefly introduce us to the Eden Project itself and share with us the most important lessons you learned through this 25 years ecological restoration journey you went through? Okay, thank you, Nolene, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, the Eden Project is located in the far west of the United Kingdom in a county called Cornwall, uh, where the spine of that province, that uh, uh, county, was given over to the extraction of China clay. It is a uh, degraded granite, so there are lots of clay mines all across the top of it. Uh, in 2000, well, in 1998, I discovered the most perfect hole in the ground. I have always been a romantic, and I have always wanted the idea of building a lost civilization in the crater of a volcano, a bit like the writer uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with his thrilling stories about lost worlds. But I wanted to have a place where you could take a place that was derelict and poisonous and create life in it and then to bring humans there to build things of great beauty in which life was enhanced and which stories of our connection and interconnection with uh, the natural world were displayed in a way that did not feel as if you were going to school, but felt like something so obvious that was being revealed to you. We made 90,000 tons of soil out of uh, a degraded material uh, and we planted several million plants and today we're the most visited uh, man-made environmental destination uh, on the planet. We have 1.1 million visitors a year. We have 50,000 school children a year. But to be honest, I would burn it down tomorrow if, it, if I didn't think it was going to persuade people that actually we are part of, not apart from nature. There is nothing more important uh, than humans getting back in their box of arrogance. Um, let's be honest, the only reason humans are here is because of extinction. If the dinosaurs were around, uh, we'd have been eaten. So extinction isn't all bad, and it's going to happen to us as well if we don't actually show some humility in all of this. And I think our duty as environmentalists, as people who believe 
uh, that we should live with the grain of nature is to do a couple of things. Science is fundamentally important and we need to get really aggressive with everybody who, who says, oh, that science is a kind of fake facts or stuff like that. No, these are professional people who are working their rocks off to actually find out the secrets of how the world works. The other thing is we should not allow ourselves to be patronized by politicians and big business when we actually do know, we do see what is going on and we should be preaching we should be preaching truth to power to say, if you do not do these things, you are personally or your corporation is, person, is as a group responsible for damaging the planet for future generations. Do you want that on your tombstone? I think we need to take leadership by the throat and show that a moral leadership, which is nothing to do with religion, but a moral leadership in terms of our duties to future generations has got to be carried out. And I, I actually feel that us scientists, are not, I don't have the privilege of being like the other three on this panel, us group, I would like to pretend to be one of them, um, we should actually be bold, we should grab leadership, and we should not be pragmatic. We've been pragmatic for too long. We need to actually be quite cold-eyed in our commitment that now is the time, and that's why it's brilliant that um, it is the UN year, year, decade of biodiversity starting. But part of that has got to be that all of us stop being wet, stop being beige, stop being flannels that other people squeeze out, and we've got to be bold. So I'm delighted to be here with such a, a wonderful group of people. So over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you so much for, for your, 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 your thought and uh, what, what, uh, that you shared with us. For me, in this group, you are the humanist. You are the new humanist for the 21st century. We had humanists in the last centuries, but I think that we need to have people like you with, with, with a, a vision and who are not afraid to really implement their vision. And that is what, for me, Eden Project is. And for that, I visited it uh, in, in October and it's just amazing. And I invite all of you to go there and to look at what can be done with a lot of energy and with a lot of commitment. So thank you very much, Tim. And uh, Eden Project is also an education place. You have a lot of things there. So it's a transition to, to Berklind. Berklind, uh, you are the deputy director for the training on land restoration uh, in uh, the University of Iceland. And uh, we have now, a cat this is a category two center under the auspice of UNESCO, we are very proud that uh, we are partnering uh, with, uh, with your institution. Um, so Berklind, over the last century, Iceland gained a wide experience and knowledge on how to combat land degradation, soil erosion and on restoration. Given that education is one of the most powerful transformative sector of the society, can you tell us how the 10-year-old land training program at GROW can play a critical role in upscaling restoration worldwide within the next decade? Yes, and uh, thank you, Noelin, and hello, hello everybody. Um, we have actually been working for 13 years uh, now at the land restoration training program that belongs to GROW, a category two center, like you said, Noelin. Um, we are a capacity development program in the field of land restoration and sustainable land management. And we work with institutions in developing countries, institutions uh, that play a key role in the field of land management and land restoration. And um, currently we are working in countries in Africa and Asia. And our aim is to strengthen the capacity of those partner institutions to promote land restoration and sustainable use of land. And we do this by offering training to employees of our partner institutions, training in halting and reversing land degradation, restoring degraded land, and in sustainable land management. And our core training activity is an annual six month training program that takes place in Iceland uh, we are based in Iceland and uh, uh, professionals from our partner institutions in developing countries, they get a study leave uh, from their work to attend the training here. And uh, 
In the training, they get a solid scientific knowledge on land restoration and sustainable land management, and also practical skills to apply their knowledge in diverse environments and communities. So they learn about how to stop plant degradation, restore degraded land, and how to engage stakeholders and communities. And they study process management to be able to bring about the necessary changes. And when these professionals complete the training, then they return back to their home countries and they continue to work at their institutions. And uh, so they go home empowered with knowledge and skills and confidence to take on the challenges at home. Um, and we at the, the Grow Land Restoration Training Program, we also design and organize short courses in our partner countries in Africa and Asia. These courses are about one week to 10 days long. And we develop those courses in close collaboration with our uh, partner institutions in each country. So these courses are tailor-made for the need and circumstances within each country. And uh, when we give those courses, then we often have the opportunity to reconnect with our former fellows uh, who have graduated from the six months training program here in Iceland, because they often have some role in giving those short courses in our partner countries. And uh, additionally, we grant scholarships to former fellows of the six months training program. Uh, they can get scholarships for masters uh, and PhD studies uh, in land restoration and related subjects at uh, Icelandic universities. So um, all of our activities, all the activities we do here at the Land Restoration Training Program, they aim at strengthening the individual and institutional capacity uh, to support and accelerate restoration and um, uh, restoration of degraded land and um, and yes to really build up um, institutional capacity which is really needed in developing uh, countries because they they often lack the resources to deal uh, with those challenges compared to the richer richer countries of the world so that's that's uh, what we do uh, and we believe this is really helping Thank you very much, Beth Lind. Thank you for um, telling us what the good work you are doing uh, in, uh, in the art here. And I take from your, 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 your presentation that uh, what you do is cooperation. And I think that cooperation between the countries, between the re regions of the world, is something that is critical if you really want to have an impact uh, on the earth. And it's also a matter of empowering people and it's a matter of solidarity. So thank you very much for, for that. And it's made me the transition to, to David. Uh, David Obura, you are the founding director of Cordio East Africa. You are based in Mombasa and the Cordio is a knowledge organization which is supporting um, research on coral reefs and marine ecosystems but you are also working a lot with communities and your research is there to really serve sustainable development for the communities so um, david uh, could you please tell us shortly about cordio and why restoring marine ecosystem needs both science and local actions and how you manage to integrate conservation and development which are, by the way, is the same objective of the MAP program. So please, David. Thank you, Neuralene, and, and good afternoon, good morning to all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and a pleasure to be on this call during this time. I'll hold my microphone up because I'm also in the wind now. It's picking up because I'm a little bit in nature. Um, but Cordio is a Kenyan research organization. We founded it about 20 years ago. And we really wanted to link research uh, with nature and societal outcomes and to deliver progress here in Kenya and in the region. Um, and your question was about conservation and development. And really, we, we've always seen it as an integral whole, working on coral reefs with fishing communities. 
it's always been clear to me that um, conservation or sustaining the environment is really the foundation for, for sustainable development, for secure development um, at, the, at the local level. And this is well captured, of course, by the sustainable development goals uh, in which they're really indivisible from, from each other. So in East Africa, and particularly in coastal regions over here, the ecosystem dependence is extremely high. Um, and I was a member of the IPBES Global Assessment Team, and the messages from that process really resonated with what we do over here, in that the ecosystem services uh, that the coral reef provides are really the foundations for security and prosperity, not only for local communities, but also for you know, coastal economic sectors, for tourism um, as well, and for sustainable cities and settlements. So, but it's particularly at the local level where you really see the importance of the multiple benefits from nature to people, the co-benefits. Um, for example, you might protect a coral reef for its beautiful fish and corals for tourism fees, but from this one act, you can also protect spawning stocks of fish, you can protect seagrass beds, you get coastal protection from rising sea levels, and you protect biodiversity across the whole tree of life um, that live on the reef. And I think what I realized right from the start working in this area is that there are two sides to this coin um, of research and knowledge and education. Of course, on the one hand, it was getting communities and local managers aware of all these values in a coral reef system, but also for us getting to see how communities depend on this system, the values that they see and they benefit from in an ecosystem, what they live on, uh, what they use, and to help uh, show that dependence and those rights to access that they have so that we can continue to sustain those. And this is why restoring ecosystems is particularly important um, at this juncture in time, as the, our ecosystems are degrading rapidly, particularly in coastal zones and here in Africa with rising population and very rapid economic growth. We now know the integrity and functioning of ecosystems is critical for the benefits that we see. So restoring these is paramount. It's challenging though. The greatest success in marine restoration um, in coastal zones is with mangroves as they are so accessible and technically feasible and I think borrow from many of the same principles that Tim um, will have applied in, in the Eden project. Um, and in addition to the multiple benefits from mangroves, uh, a bit similar to Corrie's that I mentioned already, there is the added benefit of carbon sequestration now in this time of uh, climate change and that you can you can um, gain income from carbon sequestration using blue carbon as a principle and I think this is really important um, and the last point is that when looking at uh, mangrove restoration and ecosystem restoration we need to find ways to monetize this restoration so that income can come in to finance uh, local social and economic benefits as well as uh, supporting the the long list of ecosystem benefits that restoration can provide. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for, for this very enlightening um, uh, presentation on how really research can help communities on the ground and how uh, with the results of research, we can really move forward this uh, ecosystem, especially in the, 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 the marine ecosystems, which are all we know are very much in danger too. So um, before we move to the second part of the of the conversation, is anyone want to react to what uh, the others have said? No? Okay, so let's move to the second part of our conversation. Um, COVID-19. Yes, it has hit us and um, it, uh, it's something that um, we were not expecting to, to get. So it hits, it hits the world very, very brutally. Uh, but we also hope at least some people and that this pandemic will also be a game changer. We hope that it will be a game changer and that it will really put the finger on behaviors and on poli policies and on strategies that needs to be changed. So uh, with this regard, uh, I would ask to the four of you to, to give us your view on what has COVID-19 changed in your life, in your professional life, 
but just let us know what did COVID-19 bring to your life and what, what maybe it will make you change some things in, in your life. So uh, I will uh, turn to, to David and um, uh, David, please tell us a little bit how this uh, COVID business has um, impacted, maybe especially on coastal communities because you, you are dealing with them very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marlene. Um, well, yes, this COVID crisis has, has hit Kenya very hard um, and communities over here. Um, most cases have been in Nairobi and perhaps 10% of the total of 700 or so that we know of are in Mombasa um, and small numbers in other parts of the country, including coastal zones. We have had very strong isolation orders up for about six weeks now and a nighttime curfew and very stringent movement controls in Mombasa and Nairobi, but not so much affecting rural areas where coastal communities are located. But a big challenge that we have, of course, is information and knowledge about what's really happening and what practices are positive and what practices are negative. And there's very little capacity for testing and other imposed measures. And also in, in, uh, you know, in an African rural and, and urban context, the isolation practices that are being advocated are simply not possible uh, in most villages and households, um, uh, whether human density is, is high or low. So it's very hard to understand how people can respond. Um, we work a lot with communities on the south coast of Kenya, and the reports that I've heard is that the economic and the livelihood impacts are really very high. The fishermen have lost access to markets. They cannot go to sea at night to fish. They're forced to fish during the day, which also means there's little time to sell their fish at the end of the day. And for the buyers, don't want to buy too much that they can't sell before nighttime. Um, a lot of the women involved in fishing are market sellers. And of course, they can't sell fish in the evenings. They have a very narrow uh, time when they can sell fish. This is also the month of Ramadan. Um, and, and many fishermen, most fishermen on the Kenya coast are Muslim, and so they cannot pray together, which is a huge social uh, disruption um, to, to their lives. They also can't hold meetings. Uh, there's greater insecurity. They say thieves are more common. Um, and also they're also afraid, afraid of, the, of the security, the authorities controlling and keeping people, people at home. So there's a, a huge amount of, of fear, and also domestic violence has increased in the fishing communities. So I think it's, it's clear that um, you know, this sort of a crisis brings, um, precipitates much broader consequences than we imagine just from the health dimension. And I do hope we can learn a greater understanding about how to deal with these in the future, much more broadly than, than just the, the health impact itself. Thank you. Thank you, David, to, to give us uh, really a, a sense of what is happening uh, in the communities and, and the impact will be, as you said, beyond health issues, beyond economic issues. It can also have impacts on, on social behaviors and, and even on, on, on social traditions. So uh, thank you for, for this testimony. Um, now I will turn to, to Berklint. Um, uh, but can you tell us how COVID has uh, affected your work and uh, the program of the learning program uh, at, uh, at GROW? Yes, um, COVID has uh, already had much effect on our operations so far. Um, we had to postpone this year's six months training program, uh, which was supposed to start in mid-March here in Iceland. Uh, and we have rescheduled it for 2021. Now, we were hoping in the beginning, we had to, to um, um, re postpone it uh, with a very short notice. And we were hoping we could maybe start in six weeks, two months, but then we realized very quickly that was not realistic. So you can imagine it was painful to have to postpone the training for a whole year, but it was the most sensible thing to do given the situation. We also have had to um, postpone short courses in our partner countries, uh, but we will continue to work when things open up again. Uh, but we also realized that we might need to do things differently after COVID. But um, however things turn out, we are really committed to continue to work with our partner institutions in developing countries. 
uh, because it's it's so important to to continue to fight land degradation, reverse land degradation, restore already degraded land and ecosystems, and uh, to protect biodiversity and the ecosystem services uh, that we all depend on. We we have to continue that work despite COVID. And, um, and the government of Iceland is very dedicated to continue providing resources for our training program. And also the implementing institutions of the program uh, here in Iceland, they are the Agricultural University and the Soil Conservation Service. They are also very committed to carry on, even though we might need to do things a bit differently after COVID. Um, and we are, of course, still learning from the COVID outbreak. Um, but I would say we have only already learned uh, that if we prepare for future challenges, uh, coordinate with different sectors, ground our plans on data and scientific knowledge, uh, then we are in much better position to deal with such global challenges, uh, whether it's COVID or or um, fight against land degradation, loss of biodiversity, climate change. Um, when we prepare for such global challenges, then we also have to really uh, use international cooperation. Uh, we are all on the same boat. So uh, it's very important that uh, we um, come together and prepare for such global challenges um, together because Earth is our common home. So I would say this is um, already a big lesson from COVID. Thank oh. you very much, Bethlin. Thank you. Uh, Tim, uh, tell us, please, uh, what impact you think the COVID-19 crisis would have on the awareness of general public, including Eden Project visitors? of the link between healthy biodiversity and healthy human health. Do you think that this COVID will be an eye opener to, to the public in general? The simple answer to that, sorry, brilliant answers so far from uh, Berglund and, uh, and David, which have covered a lot of the, the ground I might have covered. Uh, I think there are a number of things. First of all, I, I hope that pangolins um, get a really good time now that they are associated with the virus. Uh, I say that as a slight joke, but um, I think it's very easy for us to get over sentimental about a situation. And we do as humans love a crisis because we find it very useful to surf on the crest of that wave. The thing that I have noticed is that so many people who have been so busy with the background noise of what we all call work, which actually involves an awful lot of travel, an awful lot of chatter, an awful lot of disposable consumption, have suddenly been forced to go out and, uh, or, or if be locked in and go on a balcony or whatever, and suddenly hear the, the cacophony of the birds and the buzzing of the insects, and suddenly get rooted in seasonality and being part of the, the living systems all around them. And I don't think you can overestimate, or I'm not quite sure whether that's how I sent it, it's hard to say how important that is. So many people that I meet are talking about this. They're also talking about the fact that by communicating by the internet, which was supposed to be uh, a kind of uh, uh, inhumane form of communication, has actually been incredibly warm because you're looking people in the eyes. Look at us, we're looking at each other in the eyes, which if we were in a board meeting, we'd be sitting next to each other and we wouldn't be getting that kind of feedback. So we're staying in a sort of home environment and you know what we're doing? Where we're doing things like reading books and thinking, as, a, as opposed to just reacting, we're thinking and feeling stuff. And I think for me, the biggest thing has been a realization that the most important thing for the human species is to root ourselves back into the natural world. There is nothing more important. And I feel a desire, a muscular desire to be strong about it and to not allow it to be political at all. It is just a human thing. Let us root ourselves in that area. And a friend of mine said something really, really interesting the other day. He said, Tim, have you ever played a game called Jenga? And I don't know whether all of my fellow panelists have. Blocks of wood that you pile up to make a, as big a pile as you can. And then the game is you take one piece out at a time. 
and the last person who pulls one out and then the whole thing, the thing collapses is the loser. And he said, what COVID has done to me is to make me wonder about the way that maybe all of us have been kidded by the fact that as you look out of your window, if you're lucky, uh, you see the world looking relatively healthy around you. But what if everything is suspended like that Jenga game and then the last piece comes out and suddenly it is utter carnage everywhere? Now, I don't know about you, but if I was, um, uh, if I was, if I was king of an island or queen of an island, um, I would not wish to be anywhere near that risk that I had so disobeyed the laws of observation and being part of nature that I could leave that crisis to happen. So I'm, 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 I'm really looking forward to what Tim's going to say in a second, because I suspect that we may be entering the most important decade in human history. And the story that we can deliver requires the super storytelling that you've had from David at the far end of the window there and the, the muscular training systems and beautiful detail that, 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 that uh, we're getting out of Berglind. And maybe a bit of the storytelling bit that I do, but then in terms of the global picture and administering it and making us all feel now is the time. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, good to thank you for making the transition uh, with Tim. Uh, Tim, you are a representative of the UNE, the UN world. So please, can you tell me, tell us if you think this crisis uh, has had uh, any impact on the way policymakers are running this world? That, that, let's, let's me put it like this. Do you think that this crisis will impact the way our leaders are thinking now? So I want to build on what uh, Tim and the other panelists said. Uh, this is indeed the make or break decade. It is now or never, and science tells us that. So one of the big lessons coming out of COVID is that people suddenly listen to science again as if their life depended on it, because it does. And it is the same for climate change. Our life depends on listening to that science. Just because it happens in a little bit more of a slow motion, it is no less and probably much more of a catastrophic change that comes hurtling towards humanity than COVID. Climate change is a massively larger, massively more profound threat to humanity than COVID. And I think uh, decision makers are seeing that there is no alternative to listening to good science and with the international, the intergovernmental panel on climate change, with IPBES, for the biodiversity, we have the science. We know it's time to act. We know what to do. So we have to move from agreeing what to do to doing what has been agreed. We have the Paris Agreement, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Secretary General put it very well in his report on the economic impacts of COVID. He said that if we had made more progress on climate change and on the Sustainable Development Goals, we would be in a much better place now to deal with COVID. So it means that when we address this crisis, we also have to think about what uh, can we do to rebuild a better world? So UNEP, for example, has a three-pronged strategy on COVID. We, first of all, deal with the immediate impact, such, enormous, uh, such as enormous amounts of medical wastes uh, everywhere. But uh, the second is to look for transformative changes in nature that can enable us to relink humans to nature, as Tim said. And the third is what we call build back better the trillions of dollars of money spent now on economic recovery have to go towards a green economy. And the, the Secretary General of the UN is very explicit and very outspoken on this. And he uh, chairs the Chief Executive's Board of the UN, where also the head of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, everybody sits there and everybody agrees this has to be the moment when we invest into a uh, green recovery. And I think this is the moment where we more than ever need imagination and inspiration. So things like the Eden Project or things like the training or the, the project on the coast of Kenya are hugely important to allow people to imagine the future world. This is the most important tool for ecosystem re restoration. It is our imagination. 
if we have imagination enough to imagine what a different world could look like, we can do anything. Humans can put somebody on the moon, we can uh, do amazing things like build the internet, which is the largest infrastructure project, much larger as all the world's roads combined. If you look at all the data centers, how we're all connected these days, it is, an, it is a mind blowing undertaking. We can do all these things. Of course, we can restore the planet, but we need to treat it with the same urgency, seeing that our Jenga tower is about to collapse. Maybe it's time to put a few bricks uh, back in to stabilize it because none of us would be the loser. And if it collapses, we would all lose. Uh, so this, we can't, we can't let it come to this. Thank you very much, Tim, to enlighten us on the, the, global, uh, the, the global perspective on, on this, on the COVID and what it, it helped us to think beyond also COVID, which is very important. And uh, you talk about imagination and imagination has no boundaries. And uh, imagination is something that everyone has. Whoever you are, wherever you live, whatever you do, you have imagination. So I take it as really a, 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 good, a good keyword for, for the next decade. Let's be imaginative and let's be inspired by all the people. And what you said, the four of you, was for me very inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we are entering our last part of the of the of the panel already. Um, I will ask you to give us a thought. A, a, a thought. I don't know how to say it in English. Um, a, a key message for us to take with to, to take away with us. So would you be so kind to give us? one advice or one action on one solution that you want to share with us and with, which could help build the future societies in harmony with nature. Just one thought, one key message before we, 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 we stop this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, I will ask Berklind to, to start with uh, the one key message. Well, thank you, Noelin. And, um, well, I don't think there is one solution. There will always be many solutions. Um, uh, but the question got me to think about uh, online courses, MOOCs that we developed uh, with European partners here at GROW, Land Restoration Training Program. And those online courses address the gap between economy and ecology and business and environment. And uh, in the courses, we make um, the case that land restoration, uh, restoring ecosystems is a good business. And that message needs to reach, reach the business community and the private sector. Um, and we who are in restoration, whether it's education, science, research, outreach, we, we really have to work across sectors to get this message to these people to convince and energize the business community uh, uh, to really act and realize that land restoration is a good business. And um, well, that will surely help scale up uh, ecosystem restoration and, and help create societies in harmony with nature. So that's my answer. Thank you very much, Berklind. Uh, I will give the floor to Tim from uh, UN Environment, please, Tim. Thank you, Norlin. I would like to say to everybody watching this, and uh, hopefully uh, they will pass that message on, that saving the world is not a spectator sport. We, everybody has to get engaged now. This is the time where everybody has to be engaged, but also everybody can get engaged. Ecosystem restoration gives everyone the opportunity to find out where and how they can make a difference, be it through political lobbying or to taking action on the ground. Because the water you drink, the food you eat, all of that comes from an ecosystem near or far you. So you can get involved by starting to trace where your food comes from, where does your drinking water come from, and how can we ensure that these most essential things for human well-being uh, remain clean and abundant. 
Those are essential questions and ecosystem restoration is an important part of the answer. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, David, please, can you give us your thoughts? Yes, thank you. So actually stimulated by the, the last statements that have come from the panel, I mean, I, I very much agree with, with everything that's been said that this is a critical decade coming up. I think there's no doubt about that for climate, uh, for, for many different things, for ecosystem health. Um, but imagination is, is, is the key, imagining a better future. And we can say it's a critical decade and think that everything is, will just get worse and then people will just give up. But there's always, there's always a choice to be made. There's always different pathways to take into the future. And I think what my message from this, from this discussion and around ecosystem restoration in particular is that we can always choose a path that creates a better future rather than choosing a worse one. And it may cost more money today, but it will return more benefits later on to more people. And I think it's critical that we recognize that and that our systems validate that and really reward and incentivize those sorts of choices to choose better and build back better, as Tim said. Thank you, David. And uh, Tim, please, can you give us your thoughts? My thought. Um, the Eden Project was built not by being sentimental about young people. It was about recognizing that inside every person on this planet who's gone past the age of 40, who have left their dreams behind and feel disappointed in themselves for their lack of achievement or the, the pragmatic decisions they have made. If you can offer people a moment that they're living in history and can rewrite their past to become the people they dreamt they could be when they were 19, then there is nothing we cannot do. It is my belief, actually, that part of the problem is us old farts talk about young people as if they were the way to save the future. And I heard someone say something marvelous to me uh, about a year ago. They said, people are always asking, what sort of planet are we leaving our children? Wrong question. The question we should be asking is, what sort of children are we leaving this planet? Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you very much. And uh, what I, I take from this last part is that we are still very positive in the, on the future. Uh, we are, have, of course, technical tools, but we have, I think, the center of, of our hope is still humankind is still about us is still that we believe that we still can change and uh, this is something that is very important change and hope and uh, i still um, keep imagination let's have imagination and uh, we are all very keen to start the un decade next year so tim please lead us through this decade you have the, the um, your, your organization with FAO as the responsibility to lead the world through this UN decade. Uh, all of us here, we are very keen to be part of it in all our respective positions and institutions. And uh, I will um, um, end our conversation here by thanking the four of you. It was very enlightening it was very inspiring and um, i don't know if you want to say another a, a last word uh, but if you don't thank you so much and uh, have a nice day and let's continue this uh, work we are doing for the better of the planet and for the better of biodiversity, including human, because we are one species among all the biodiversity on the world. Thank you very much. And thank you and UNESCO for organizing this. Thank you, Nolene. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>